Devin Pike with the Dallas International Film Festival. My next guests are no strangers to the festival. In fact, I, I, I can't think of running around Diff on the course of any fortnight of film without seeing these three lovely people. But the interesting thing is they're not here to talk about the festival. And it's got to be a little bit weird being on this side of the fishbowl, first off. It's Dennis Molina and Michael. And they're on first name basis with me because, well, I paid them an amazing amount of money on their Kickstarter campaign for the film <laughs> Stark, a documentary on the ubiquitous Dallas night spot from the 80s and, well, I can't even think about Dallas at that point without thinking about the club. First off, congratulations on a phenomenal film and welcome to the festival, guys. Thank you. <laughs> it's so nice to be on this side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a little surreal to, to do press for a film with a festival that each of you has worked so hard on over the last eight years? Yeah. It's, it's surreal just to be doing yeah. press on a film that's taken five years. Yeah. <laughs> a five year project and uh, hundreds of interviews out, uh, over I'd, I'd imagine about about 800 900 hours of footage or how many how much raw footage did you guys wind up shooting for the project well we quit actually even thinking about it in hours we're 18 terabytes of information um, enough so that the drives start to crash because there's so much information but 125 interviews we shot everywhere from well Dallas of course to LA to New York to Manchester to London to San Francisco, San Francisco, Austin. I feel like somewhere else, Paris, yeah. Philippe Stark in yeah, Paris. Paris. So we've traveled the world to, to get the story right. I'm curious, each of your first experience walking into Stark for the first time, from the line to getting into the club to the unisex bathrooms to the, the amazing array of Dallas characters who came in and just people from around the country and the world on a week-to-week -week basis. And Dennis, I, I, for, from your perspective, I'd like to get your perspective on it first. Well, it's kind of ironic because I never went to the club <laughs> while it was open. Poser! No, no. <laughs> um, I was making movies at the time, and so whenever, you know, here in Dallas, some uh, directors, producers, et cetera, would come to town and they would want to scout, so I would scout the club. Uh, then they'd want to know about it for you know its reputation, et cetera, not only as a location. Then the, you know, then the next morning, you know, we'd set, start scouting again, and they'd be all you know uh, tired and everything. Where have you been? Well, we've been all night at you know Star Club. Then on the movies I was doing, um, we'd be shooting, and somebody would drag in in the morning, like usually the sound mixer, and we're, what's what's the deal with you? Well, I was at Star Club all night long, so I began to see the impact it was having, and also being able to tour and hear the stories. But also the impact that it was having, you know, on music, on the city, and the culture in general, and the fact at that time I was so pro Dallas and Texas, and trying not for Texas to be J.R. Ewing Texas, but to be what it really it was, was very important to me. Melina. Well, I didn't go to the club either. I was too young. What is going on with you? <laughs> you did go to the uh, reincarnation well, of the club. You took, you oh, took one. Sorry. Well, I found out later. Can you edit my, that out? <laughs> my daughters are similar to her age, and they were young teenagers at the time, and I found out about a year or so ago that they would, uh, with fake IDs, get into the Stark Club. That was how I got in. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, I'm not going to lie. Kind of yeah. <laughs> well, I went to the reincarnation of the club in 1999, and I guess we'll spill the beans. There's no better place to do it than here. But um, Michael and I actually had our very first kiss on the dance floor of the Star really? Club no. in 1999 on a rainy night. Um, and so that was my first time ever to go into the club. It's like an hour long kiss, honestly. <laughs> you an hour song. Long we can put it in the film. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, when did you go to the club, Michael? He lived there. Uh, well, actually, you know, I, I did go to the club while it was open. So I, the first time was in 1986, probably early part. I was in commercial real estate uh, in my 20s in Arlington. And uh, actually, my girlfriend at the time was from Arkansas. Her hairdresser in Arkansas knew of the club and had told the family when they came down they needed to go. So we went to the club. It was actually an off night. So... Uh, I'm assuming we went on like a Wednesday or Thursday and you arrived and you're in a seedy part of town and you're underneath a freeway and all you can imagine is this is going to be bad and you get to the door and they're still at the door sort of like okay 
we'll let you in. Even though there's nobody else that night waiting to get in, they still had to make sure we were cool enough to get in. And you walk in and it's just another world. And uh, interesting enough, it probably had several hundred people in the club, but when you have a club built for 3,000 people, it felt very intimate. And it, it honestly felt uh, the lighting was minimal, the music was fantastic, anyone you saw was a character. They had, uh, you know, it was black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, flamboyant. I mean, it was everything just walking kind of out of shadows into the light and then passing by you again. And I, I, honestly, that one night was life changing. And I ended up going back to the club probably 10 or 15 times uh, over the next few years before it closed in 89. But kind of under different terms, I had lost everything in real estate, luckily, and gotten into film. So suddenly it was this kind of amazing film set. Oh, that's just a rich milieu of just everything in that little sparse space. When you were speaking to the club founders or Grace Slick or any, great, Grace Slick, Grace Slick, I swore I was not she, going to do that. She did go to the club, by the way. So Excellent. Yeah, you would be covered. Excellent. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, was there one, when you were speaking to Philippe or any of the, the club's founders, was there one element in the club's genesis as you're talking to them for the documentary that surprised you or something that just completely took you, um, took you aback that I can't believe that that was, you know, in, in part of the plans to begin with? Well, I, I tell you what was not in the plans that happened on the first night, which was the unisex bathrooms. And that's something that the club's really known for. Philippe Stark, sort of presented that that was what was going to happen but I think you know being Dallas uh, belt buckle of the Bible belt you know all of these guys they were kind of like that didn't make sense to them and then on opening night it suddenly happened everyone you know migrated there um, that was a pretty cool factor because it really set every the tone that you could not be comfortable that you were going to be challenged and it was going to be fun but that uh you know, there's something about going into a restroom and there's the opposite sex. You're like, immediately you're kind of thrown off in Dallas anyway. And, you know, I think we saw also plans, by the way, early on. They were not going to be in that building. They were going to be in a different building, the actual White Swan building. Oh. And uh, the landlord backed out kind of at the last minute. And so they had plans where those stairs that are in the start club actually extended all the way out through the back and through the roof. And oh, so wow. it led to the, the rooftop. So... It's pretty incredible to watch it change over the years. It took them three years to build it. Mm. And instead we had the spaghetti warehouse in there instead. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it um, a, a film like this, not only do you have all of the interviews to gather, and you know that a, as a documentary filmmaker, you have to get certain people. Otherwise, the documentary just doesn't work if you don't have that voice. But more importantly, for a film like Stark, the music is massively important. Did you have a cleric level music clearance person working with you, or did you guys have to wind up doing all of it yourselves? We had a rock star working with us to clear the music. And her, she's an associate producer on the film, and her na name is Risa Morley. She's a part of a bigger team that came to us. Um, which through a friend that we made through the Deep Ellum Film Festival that we've all known for many years, and that's Bill Paxton and Tom Huckabee, and we were introduced to a man named Seymour Stein, who started Sire Records. He discovered Madonna, the Ramones, the Talking Heads, Depeche Mode, everybody. He's, he was, if you were a, a band in the 80s in this genre, he was discovering you. And so we first talked to Seymour, and Seymour said, we would love, I'd love to be a part of this. You know, these are all my bands. And, um, but you've got to talk to Risa because Risa is the one who can call all the bands. And um, if you come and see the film and you see the credits roll and you see the special thanks, it says special thanks music and all of those people, she worked really hard and we have an incredible soundtrack. Really amazing. For the film, and it, it's an increasing reality for, for independent film, is uh, a crowdfunding campaign. Before you started it, did you realize how much work crowdfunding winds up being over the course of, it was an eight-week campaign, I believe, or the, the, the one I remember was eight weeks, but there were actually multiples for it, if I remember. Two, we did two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Jason Cerrone, if he were here, he's, he's the vice president of M M3 Films, and he's run all of the campaigns that we've produced, and it is a full-time job. It's 40 hours a week, and I don't think... I mean, Michael was very involved in the first campaign on social media and 
you know, keeping the word out there. But it is, um, I mean, it's 40 hours a week plus, in addition to your regular job. So I think that that definitely caught us by surprise. But we were pleasantly surprised by the way that it also, well, we raised money, but we also raised awareness for the project. And I think that that is an extra benefit for crowdfunding is the awareness that it creates in the community. Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, the, we actually did the first fundraise to finish music rights because as we started out, we thought we'd get, you know, eight great songs and we ended up over 20. And so we, we had the, the thought we can nip this off, not go after these extra songs or we can ask people to help do that and, and Wade Randolph Hampton is a producer on the film and actually went to the Start Club back in the 80s and really you know as a working DJ and connected with some of the top DJs in the world and particularly the electric dance music you know tying him together with this crowdfunding with Risa Morley and Seymour Stein I think that was part of it we were crowdsourcing we were literally reaching out and creating a crowd of people who then were excited about the soundtrack as much as they were the movie are you looking at um, a possibility of a soundtrack album tied in with the film's production? Yes, we are. Yep. And something unique that Wade is working on, too, is possibly getting some of the DJs to remix some of the older songs. So um, there's some interesting things coming down. We already know the first song that we're going to be doing a remix of, so it's pretty exciting. And it's from Book of Love. I won't go into which one it is yet, but they'll actually be in town this weekend. Uh, at the party that we're throwing afterwards. I mean, actually, the film. I think there's a life after this. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much. The, there's so many stories. There's so much, you know, music. That this is just a beginning. It's really like a pilot, and the opportunities we feel beyond uh, this film are amazing. And it's very difficult to cram all of this, all these interviews, all these stories, into you know 90 minutes or 100 minutes. So we're very excited about you know what's next. I mean, we're, we're really thinking down the road. But the film, I don't, we were talking earlier, I don't think this film will ever be finished until a distributor says stop, you know, because we just, it's constant new people coming on board, new ideas, uh, new information. It's, that part is very exciting. And all the way it impacted people's lives um, is, it's just, I mean, chill bumps. I mean, it really is exciting. It's way beyond this bricks and mortar club, you know. And, so a five-year journey to get it on the screen for the first time, and it's still not even over for you guys. Right. You, this isn't even a finish line. I mean, it, it's, it's obviously a goal line because getting it to this point where you can put it in front of audience. Who, who owes us money? Who owes us drinks? <laughs> oh, crap, I do. <laughs> um, just as a goal line, it's got to be gratifying, but knowing that you still got further to travel, too. Yeah, well, the, really, this is the first time that we're going to have a chance to screen the film with an audience and that's so important to a filmmaker to see the rhythm of your movie and if people are laughing when you think they're gonna laugh or laughing when you didn't think they were gonna laugh or crying and so there is always an opportunity as Michael and Dennis both know with all the movies that they've done to go back in and take another pass at the film once we've seen it we're screening it twice so we'll get two different audiences in two different venues Two different times of day, which it, that makes a difference as well. Two different bar times, <laughs> got it, got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, get to see kind of how they respond to it and then, you know, take another pass at it. I mean, a week ago we decided to reopen the movie and new information, new stuff. And so Miles has been uh, working like crazy, worked till 5.45 this morning. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, Sunday screening might be a little different than the Saturday <laughs> screening. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> It just keeps changing, and we're trying because we are so dedicated to doing, making the best film we could possibly make, and that never stops. And, and as far as the long journey goes, our intent was always to create what we called the Stark Project. The Stark Project is an umbrella that had the documentary under it, and then a narrative, whether it was a series or a narrative feature film, and then this archive of uh, interviews. So. We, we, this, our team worked on um, TV Junkie that was at Sundance years ago, and that was 3,000 hours of footage. And when we came out of that, part of it was the frustration of knowing some of the best stuff was, you know, on the cutting room floor. We never could make it into the film. So we went into this saying, we're going to get these great interviews, you know, an hour of Philippe Stark or uh, Paul Oakenfold or Larry Hagman or Peter Hook. 
you know, you, you, we're only using, say, five minutes of it in the movie because the story, you can't have a 90-minute story with all of these people in there getting their due. So ours was always to have this umbrella, the Stark Project, where people could go and watch the full interview or watch clips from the interview. So I think that's where filmmakers are going to start going to, is monetizing uh, the rest of the assets and not just throwing it out once the movie's finished. Or just putting it out there and you know whatever people want to discover on their own is fine, but you know being able to have it be a, an additional revenue stream for future projects as well. Yeah, and what we've done, some of the graduates of Katy College, have uh, they brought them on board, and they've gone through these interviews and they're cutting them down to one to three minute clips that we're putting up to help promote the film, but also help tell the story, because there's a lot of people that we interviewed that aren't in the film. So it's one way for us to put them out there and also to just say there is so much more look. you know, And, and every one of these little short pieces makes you want to see more because there is more. And that's part of the reason we're doing it. So it's a, it's a community here that's <laughs> making this film. I don't think we're even finished interviewing too. That's, that's a part right. of it too. The, I haven't they been said, interviewed yet. I, I was interviewed and it was horrible. It was really <laughs> like a brick wall. Physician, heal thyself, director, mm -hmm. interview thyself. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see Stark in whatever form it's going to take, uh, and a couple of times here at the festival, and then you can also find, what, what is the website for the Stark Project? Starkproject.com. That's horrible, I'll never yeah, remember I never that. remember that. And then uh, on Facebook, it's more complicated, it's Stark Project on Facebook. Again, never going to be able to remember that. I'll have to write myself a post-it note. Mm -hmm. And you can always find out films, uh, information about all the films at the festival as well as our alumni films at DallasFilm.org. Guys, again, congratulations on getting to this goal point at least, and it's not the end goal. So I, I'll say congratulations and best of luck for the future of the Stark Project. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Nice job.